My name is Mina Chikara, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at Harvard University. So very generally, my lab studies how tribalism, how social groups shape people's thoughts, emotions, brains, and behavior. So for example, we study how phenomena such as empathy and communication break down when the social context shifts from me and you to us and them. And we're equally interested in the consequences of these shifts, for example, discrimination, conflict, and even outgroup harm. So when I say outgroup, I just mean all the groups to which you don't belong, and in-group, of course, meaning the groups to which you do belong. So humans and many other species very reliably divide the world up into us and them, in-groups and out-groups. And on one hand, people reap numerous psychological as well as material benefits from being able to identify fellow group members and cooperate with them. But of course, group living also has its costs. For example, it produces pressure to conform, so sometimes making us do or say things we wouldn't otherwise want to do or say. And in other cases, it of course causes intractable conflict between groups. So by some counts, the 20th century saw over 200 million civilians killed in acts of intergroup conflict, including genocide and warfare. Now these atrocities are kind of difficult for us to square with our everyday experiences. Oftentimes when I talk to people about my research, I ask them questions like, when was the last time you punched somebody? And they kind of look bewildered for a moment before they say, well, I've never punched anybody. And then I say, well, when was the last time you saw someone punch somebody else, not in the context of, say, a, a boxing match? And they say, gosh, I don't know that I ever have. So what it suggests, what it implies is that more, we, people have very strong moral prohibitions that keep them from harming other people most of the time. So how do we make sense of these two seeming incompatibilities? And it's even more surprising when we look at the actual psychology literature. For example, there is a wealth of evidence that suggests that people fundamentally are, are programmed to cooperate, or for example, that they're willing to pay more money to prevent harm to other people than harm to themselves. And people even seem to experience physiological aversion, nasty feelings when they're asked to do things that would normally normally be associated with harming another person, like shooting a fake gun, but that doesn't actually cause harm. So again, it's, this tension is really what drives my interest because from where I'm sitting, what it seems like is that inner group dynamics, that is the us versus them lens, acts as a pr primary or critical boundary condition on all of the moral values that we seem to have that we bring to bear on our interactions with other people when we're acting just as one-on-one. -on -one. So for example, I've been really interested in empathy and how empathy changes depending on who we're interacting with. So how do you feel when you witness or learn of another person's misfortune? Oftentimes people say that they feel bad, they feel what the person is feeling or they feel some version of what you know they think a person in that situation would feel. But of course, it's not the case that you empathize with all people all of the time, nor would it make sense if you did. It'd be hard to get out of bed, I imagine. And so, of course, an alternative is that people feel nothing. They feel apathy. One of the puzzles for me is that apathy is typically not a good promoter of aggressive behavior. So that suggests that maybe there are other kinds of emotions that are more important for predicting things like intergroup aggression and conflict. What we find is that oftentimes people feel the exact opposite of empathy pleasure in response to other people's misfortunes, what the Germans call schadenfreude, and that that actually is a better predictor of when people say they're willing to harm people from another group. So one of the test cases in which we've studied this is actually with Red Sox and Yankees fans. And in this study, what we did was we recruited them and had them watch baseball plays where their own team did well, or their rival failed, or their rival did well, and even special cases where their rival played against the Orioles and did poorly. And not surprisingly, uh, Red Sox and Yankees fans not only enjoyed it when their own team did well, they enjoyed it when the other team, the rival, did poorly, even when the rival did poorly against the Orioles. And so what was interesting to us is that, you know, if you're not a baseball fan, watching a baseball game on TV has no meaning. So the way that people's emotions are shaped are shaped entirely by their social identification as either a Red Sox or a Yankees fan. So really it's that lens that I use to study all manner of psychological phenomena, decision-making, emotions, because I think that if we can better understand that, we can better understand exactly how to mitigate intergroup conflict, whether it's between sports fans, different nations, or political parties.